Welcome, everyone. I'm Leila Halal, the director of the Middle East Task Force at the New America Foundation. And we have with us a very uh, exciting uh, group of speakers from uh, Egypt. I'm very pleased to, to welcome them. Um, we're, we're also uh, being recorded uh, with, by C-SPAN. Welcome to the viewers. Um, can you please mute your cell phones and for the panelists, turn them off? OK, excellent. Um, so uh, to my immediate right is Ahmed Maher. He is the co-founder and chief coordinator of the April 6th Youth Movement, which stresses nonviolence and collective action. The April 6th Movement uh, is, is quite well known for Egypt followers. They were active in mobilizing workers and citizens leading up to and during the uh, January 2011 revolution. Ahmed uh, was nominated uh, for a Nobel Peace Prize for his pioneering activities in community mobilization. And he continues to play an important role in Egypt's political scene, promoting democratic principles <laughs> and social and economic inclusion through uh, his, his movement. Uh, Jawad <coughs> Nobosi is a leading activist in Egypt, was also very present on the scene in January's 2011 activities uh, uprising. Do we call it a revolution? I'm, I'm not Did sure. <laughs> uh, he is co-founder of the Nebni Foundation, which is ranked as one of the fastest growing NGOs in Egypt. They focus on social justice and citizen responsibility. And Jawad is, uh, founded the Leadership for Change program, which emphasizes entrepreneurial uh, activity amongst youth in Egypt. He is also a founder of the Legislative Support Council, uh, which, is, uh, or, which was organized to formulate draft laws for submission to the People's Assembly. I'm not sure if you're still active with this organization. Um, <laughs> But uh, Jawad is also advising, or was advising, several members of parliament and uh, political parties, and is a board man member of the Egyptian Water Regulatory Agency. Noor Lark is a senior policy analyst at the International Peace Institute, a think tank linked to the United Nations in New York. She focuses on transitions in the Arab world and has done a, a very a, a in-depth research project on youth movements and youth uh, activism in Tunisia and Egypt. And she will soon be publishing uh, this work. She also looks at issues of foreign policy and in the intersection of uh, the Arab uprisings and, and international policy towards the MENA. Um, so we welcome Noor as a discussant to help us broaden uh, the, the conversation through a comparative lens. Ahmed, I'm going to start with you and ask you some questions um, about your movement. Uh, Egypt has had uh, two rounds of elections, first the parliamentary elections at the end of 2011 and then the presidential elections. And your movement chose not to participate in these elections and you continue, I, as I understand, to um, adopt a different approach to political activism in Egypt. Uh, former Secretary uh, Clinton was critical of this decision by, by youth groups and by different organizations not to participate in elections. So I'm wondering if you can help us understand uh, your, movement's, your, your de um, movement's decision not to participate in elections and your philosophy of activism. Uh, and the kinds of activities you're engaging in now. Okay, first of all, I, I thank you about um, uh, this opportunity and this question also. Uh, it was a discussion after the revolution uh, in our movement that uh, what is the role we can play after the revolution? It's a political party or uh, dissolving the movement or what? So it seems like the instability will stay in Egypt uh, during the transition period. So it's very important to have a political party and politicians running the elections. It's very important. And also, it's very important to have a lobbying group and watchdog groups and 
pressure groups uh, to advocate the process for democracy. So it's our rule. We can, we, uh, politicians or political parties can participate in, in, in the elections. And our rule to uh, make a pressure, our rule to advocate, to watching, to uh, support any good efforts and be against any bad efforts, uh, uh, keep a struggle against any dictatorship or something like that. So we didn't participate in the elections. Uh, also, it was the rules of the elections and this roads from the referendum in March 2011, it was uh, wrong roads to leading for democracy. So we criticized the referendum of the constitution in 2011 and we didn't participate in the elections in uh, November. But the first participating in the election was in, um, in 2012. And it was a big event that we supported Morsi. Uh, because in the presidential elections, we said we need just one candidate to support from, from the revolution. And we uh, asked all the revolutionary candidates to be united, and they refused. So the second round between Morsi and Shafi, we didn't support Shafi. So we supported Morsi to step down Shafi. And that is the first, our first participating and supporting someone in the election. Now in this election, uh, depending about the Salvation Front decision, uh, we have, maybe we haven't uh, official uh, candidates in our movement. Uh, the majority want to keep a struggle, not to participate uh, as a politicians. But we have four or five or 10 members want to participate. And also I'm working with Jawad in something like that to, to bring the use from many movements to participate in the elections. But we need united uh, list for, for the opposition against Muslim Brotherhood. And this decision uh, must to agree from Salvation Front and all the youth movement. So it's, uh, the decision is, is not now. It's not clear till now about the elections. So the National Salvation Front is the secularist opposition movement, which uh, had uh, sort of coalesced in response to actions by the Morsi government that are viewed as, as authoritarian. Um, they originally said they were boycotting the elections, and recently we've heard that they may be stepping away from, from this position. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, what that decision is based on and um, you know, whether or not actual participation by the opposition is, is likely? Uh, for me personally, I support the idea of participating in the elections <coughs> because we have a chance now. The popularity of Muslim Brotherhood now is down, not like before, because they they have many um, uh, bad decisions and they there's a economical crisis in Egypt now. They can't govern Egypt now, um, so the opposition have a chance to win and get the majority in elections, but Salvation Front. Uh, see that uh, the rules of the game is controlled by Muslim Brotherhood and the authority and there is no enough uh, international observation. Uh, there is many tricks and many games played in the election so they will not running and they will not participate in the election until it's, it's uh, if they sure that is uh, clear and fair uh, election. So the decision till now is not clear for the Salvation Front. We support the idea of participating and we try to convince them to participate. Uh, they said it's, uh, it's a fake game, fake election, so we will not participate. And uh, before we move on to Jawad and bring him in, t can you tell us a little bit about the activities of, of your April 6 movement now, aside from the question of the elections? What, what are your uh, main uh, focus areas um, in terms of mobilizing people and in this current environment in Egypt? Uh, unfortunately, after the revolution, we, we, we consider that it's now freedom and the revolution uh, succeeded. So we will participate in social efforts and services uh, and build uh, the new Egypt. But we, we found the same situation, the same dictatorship, the same rules. Our members arrested now and put in the jail and sometimes have a torture. So our rule now to keep struggle against this regime, this regime is the same old regime, but have uh, religious 
uh, atmosphere or religious shape, but the same rules, the same constitution, the same uh, law, the same behavior, the same strategy, the same politics. So we need to keep a struggle until step down all of that regime. So our rule now, it's unfortunately like before the revolution. Okay, Jawad, uh, you are uh, leading this new um, NGO that's very focused on working with communities to achieve change, perhaps before the politicians actually bring it to, to the Egyptians. So can you tell us a little bit about what your organization is doing and your perspective given you know, the current state of politics in, in Egypt? So uh, in the beginning, we, uh, a group of us took a different path than most of the other revolutionaries. So we said we need to go down to the people who actually we, we rallied for and make them feel that the revolution has did some kind of positive influence. Because at the end of the day, the normal Egyptian, I mean, like any human being, he cares about his basic needs, you know, education, health, food, security, you know, housing. So if they don't, if people, and this is, and this is what actually gave us, gave us legitimacy or gave us any kind of support, is that people were standing behind us. So if we did not go down and show the people that we have done, and this revolution has, has done something positive, in this element, then we, then the revolution would not have succeeded. So we went to one of the largest uh, slum areas in Egypt with a million two hundred thousand population, and we took a street and uh, we just tr decided to make it a model street in terms of education, health, um, environment, and see what are the core problems. And uh, on the other hand, we we know that on the long term, that for us to continue struggling that we need to have a proper, a proper uh, uh, organization that can actually support us or support our struggle on the long time. And this needs time. I mean, uh, if you're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood, they've been there for 80 years. I mean, and one of the reasons that you don't find the revolutionaries on, on the scene is because most of them are drained out. Either lost their jobs, they can't, you know, they're, they're really tired, exhausted emotionally. And this is because they don't have a backing of an organization or a structure that actually can you know, replace them when they're tired and have someone speak that time and someone else comes later and next. So luckily now we have you know, a full-time staff, uh, eight full-time staff. We have, our work has affected around 200,000 people uh, and we're self-funding. And one of the reasons I'm here for such a, I mean, quite a I mean, time now is because things are running without uh, me there. And this is, this is what, w what we believe is that all of us should be doing, I mean, whether on politics or on the civil society level. To create sustainable <coughs> institutions. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about your work on this one street in, in Cairo, what, what you've done and what you've been able to achieve? So uh, we basically um, we took, uh, like we took the houses and the people living inside it, so 73 houses and, and people living inside them, and analyzed what are their main issues. So, uh, and I took an apartment, I moved there for like, I, mo I, st I stay there three or four times a week. Um, so uh, uh, we found that the number one issue was employment, because most of the people have been affected by uh, the tourism industry. And most of them are workshops that actually fund the tourism uh, uh, industry. So what we did is that we, t we went to, we, we met, went to all these workshops, met, uh, over like 300 of them, and uh, redesigned their products and created uh, a market for them and, and exhibitions. And this created a lot of uh, 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 people working and a lot of people getting back to work. Uh, in terms of healthcare, um, you know, I, I don't know if people know this, but we have one of the highest rate of virus C in the world. I, I, I did not know that actually uh, it was that bad. Highest 18, rate of uh, hepatitis C. Hepatitis. So we have, a, so 18% of the Egyptian population do have hepatitis C. and. Uh, and, and that's a disaster, and, and, and this is actually one of the crimes. So we started you know, working on prevention programs, and uh, alhamdulillah, and, uh, we found there is a medical center in the area, the main one, and it has been closed for five years. The government just totally forgot about it. And it took us two years to fight the government to allow us to take it and open it. They wouldn't give it to us because they thought we have uh, international, you know, we're, uh, we're spies and so on and so forth. 
So uh, this is under Mubarak. This is under the no, <laughs> under the new. Uh, under this the is new. just the, the past right, two years. Right, it's been two years. Yeah. yeah so two years, <laughs> you know. I mean, two years trying to open a medical center to help the people with no political agenda whatsoever. Just and it's been so hard. So yeah. So you've opened this clinic. We're no. We we just got we got the, the agreement the to open the clinic, and they gave us like a a, a four months time span. If we don't actually fundraise and open it, then we they take it back again. So such such a, a huge efforts for one small uh, clinic. It's <laughs> not a clinic. What, it's, what, a, it's a what medical is, center. Yeah. What is your prospect then? I mean, what, how do you see Egypt going in, in the in the medium term? You mean economically, or you mean economically, politically? I mean, what given are, are people in the given your activities are people enthusiastic about the prospect of? of change are they more engaged do you, do you are you optimistic given your experiences so 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 people who were involved in the revolution has has gone through a, a curve so we were really celebrated in the beginning of the revolution and then it went downhill from there and what we realized uh, just recently like maybe three four months ago that people are coming back and saying like you know where have you guys been uh, I was like, where have we been? <laughs> so, so I'm, people now are realizing that the youth, the ones who were involved in the revolution, the ones who actually have no personal interest in other than we love the country and we want the best, are maybe the best candidates to run for. So, for example, Ahmed was talking about now we're working on uh, uh, a youth list to run for parliament. And, and I'm talking to like, like many different, different youth who are under 40. This is one of the requir requirements. And uh, of course, we're fundraising for it. And whether people like it or not, but we're coming within the next five, six, seven, ten years. We will um, hopefully, and if we don't get killed by the regime, we will outlive. <laughs> <laughs> we will outlive the, what's going on right now, and we will be organized. We will be funded. We will, we will have uh, institutions. We will have structures. I mean, the the legislation le legislation committee is probably uh, the first committee to work on not actually. Uh, getting a seat in parliament, but actually having uh, uh, legislation that can be passed in parliament. So, I mean, most of the people who are running for parliament and ask the, all the parties, they don't have a legislative agenda, which is a disaster. And in the parliament before, people would come to me in parliament, tell me, do you have a, a, a legislation that you know, might be good that we work on? And that's a problem. So I'm optimistic very much. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's one of the positive things is that people are still mobilized. Is that right, Ahmed? Do you is there is there a fear that that people have given up on on the um, the notion of revolution and big transformative change, and they're becoming increasingly apathetic, and that will lose traction? Or is there this sense of optimism that Jawad is speaking of that is that will sustain longer term change. Yes, it's, uh, it's pretty important that the people keep struggling uh, to achieve our demons. And also, I think it's, uh, it's a good rule that if we keep struggle and keep demonstrate and keep pressure against uh, the wrong issues and uh, the bad rules and any dictatorship, and it's a uh, good uh, cooperation with Jawad in his efforts and sometimes now we try to learn from uh, the social efforts that now we in EPRSEX we make a branch as an NGO as a foundation to uh, connect the, the street and the people now with, with services to also it will help to mobilizing and in, at the, uh, the time of voting sometimes. So uh, yes it's, uh, it's uh, make me optimistic that is, uh, the new generation now they will, we will not stop uh, uh, until we have a real freedom and real dignity and real social justice. So uh, if we uh, stop struggle, if we said, okay, I, we, I want to keep my job and I want to uh, live in peace. So there is a new generation, uh, 18 years old, 20 years old, who will keep. You know? So it's, uh, the, the issues make me optimistic. Okay, so in terms of uh, achieving a, a, a change at the, at the macro level, which can sustain um, a, a new Egypt, um, 
I, I'm curious to get from the both of you your perspective on what is the biggest challenge for Egypt. Is it um, the re regime remnants? Um, is it the failing institutions and the political inertia? Or is it political Islam? Or is there uh, a fourth factor uh, that, that is a major barrier? I mean, how, how do you sort of measure these challenges in terms of your political activism? And um, what should we stay focused on in, in uh, I benchmarking think Egypt's all of transition? Them. All of them. Uh, we have economic crisis, and Muslim Brotherhood, they can doing well. Uh, there is no jobs, there is very bad salaries, there is no education. They, they haven't plans to make that. I, I remember that after the revolution, I, we met the, the SCAF, the Supreme Ministry Council, and we gave them many projects about how to d develop the traffic, uh, security, education, how to build the new factories, uh, industrial factories, and get jobs. And they ignored everything, how to change the government, how to change security. And they ignored everything, and they protected the same regime. And now with Morsi, I met President Morsi four times uh, from July until uh, uh, November 2012. And me and my colleagues in many movements represent to him many projects with many expertise and many researchers uh, from many institutions in Egypt about how to make development in the security, in traffic, in uh, how to solve economical crisis, how to have alternatives, but he ignored everything and insisting on to keep the same regime, keep the same mentality and protect the authority. So the priority for us to, to break uh, or to prevent this dictatorship, they want to be like the NDB, the Mubarak party in the authority. They want to keep the authority. They are afraid from losing anything. They promised us at the beginning, when, when we voted and we supported Morsi, they promised us, you are my, our partners, the vice president will be from outside Muslim Brotherhood, the prime minister will be from outside Muslim Brotherhood, it will be uh, very liberal and very good uh, terms in Egypt, it will be very good constitution for all Egyptian. I am the president of all Egyptian, but they broke promises, they ignored any promise after that. So. That is the mess of, of trust, make this conflict between the opposition and the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, uh, Jawad, do you want to add? Yes, so, so I have from my th is three main issues. Uh, one issue we underestimate is what people sometimes call the deep state in Egypt, right? That actually in every aspect that we actually try to interfere, we find a big enemy that has special financial interest that they're willing to actually die for uh, and fight you and threaten your life so you don't touch it. So for example, uh, we, we built a school uh, and we, we, we have a, a, an education program for uh, the kids in school. And, and, and the ones who actually were filing the police complaints against me were the teachers of the schools because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, they're, they're charging like 100 pounds per month and I'm charging like 10 pounds per month to just uh, to educate the child. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, the, the corruption in every, in, in education, in health, in environment, in, in, in all, I can tell you stories about how, like, st like what people are doing and, and every, every system is like a mafia from the, I mean the governor is new, he's, uh, he's, I mean he changed like twice. But from one from that below the government all the way down, they ha it's a complete system that is, it's so hard to fight on your own. And, and, and they have their ways and without actually, you know, people, you know, uh, uh, noticing to, to put you down. Uh, the second thing I think, and, and this has been obvious more and more uh, when we talk with younger people with different ideologies, is the generation war. I think there's a, there's a generation gap that no matter how much you try to talk to them, someone has been used to doing, uh, a certain or, or acting in a way for 40 years or 50 years. It's so hard now to come and try to explain and, and, and communicate, you know, <laughs> the uh, uh, innovative solutions. Uh, they, they look to you as if you are, you know, you're coming from a different, uh, different planet. So, and this is, we just have to out, outlive them. 
hopefully if we continue. <laughs> the third thing, I just have the last one, uh, is the, uh, the ideological issue. I think, I think maybe you overemphasized uh, you know, the ideological issue too much. And unfortunately, and, I, and, and we were at a Camp David-like thing we had all, that was in, in, in Williamsburg, where we had a group of all like, the political parties, including the Muslim, brother, Muslim Brotherhood and all the rest, is that the young, the, the, we will own the Tahrir Square, everyone, right? Different ideologies. We didn't have that issue. What I'm worried about is that the, the older generation are feeding within the younger generation their, their ideological, uh, uh, what do you call it, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, roughness and, and, and stubbornness and trying to d disperse us. So I think, you know, these are the three main issues, and, and I know I'm taking too much time. So No, no, please. I think that that's a very interesting uh, notion that you're, you're fighting, um, you're fighting tradition and, and ideology, and I assume that ideology goes beyond political Islam yeah. to being sort of a deference to authority and hierarchy. Yeah. Um, because I've heard a lot of people in different countries that are going through uprisings and revolutions say that the youth are very uh, worried about uh, people coming in and attempting to recreate centralized authorities no matter where they come from, no matter if they're coming from the Islamist wing or, uh, or a liberal wing. Um, so, Noor, maybe you can comment a bit mm -hmm. on sort of... Um, <laughs> Uh, on, on youth activism and, and given your comparative research between Egypt and Tunisia and sort of the expectations that the youth have and mm -hmm. in this new era. Yeah, well, um, I found that most youth are active in civil society and not in political parties um, because they, I mean, and this means that from the outside they're seen as being disenfranchised and marginalized. But they themselves tend to see civil society as where the power is. So one of the people I interviewed said that to you, politics is power, but to her, it's society where power lies. And um, there's still this sort of legacy of mistrust um, when it comes to politics um, because of the last five decades of authoritarian rule and this feeling of frustration with the current political parties that they're only interested in in um, power as opposed to actually resolving any of the issues that they've been talking about. Um, and finally also feeling amongst youth that they're not ready to actually participate within the political system right now. So that takes us back to what are they doing in civil society. There I found that they're much more focused on rights-based issues or playing the role of watchdog over parliament or the constitution process. Um, and which has actually led to some criticisms that there's not enough focus on issues of social justice. I mean, yours is obviously one of the groups that's working on that issue. But um, on the whole, I found that in my interviews, it tended to be the Islamist-leaning youth NGOs that were focusing on social development work, which again is kind of um, a legacy of what existed before the revolution. Um, and in terms of, um, is that, do you want sort of an overview or? And so the Islamist youth are focused on social justice. What yeah, are the more liberalized youth focused well, on? Well, and I think that that raises an interesting question because in terms of the road mm -hmm. to political power in the future, who is going to kind of build a better base? Is it going to be the youth who, who are fo focusing on citizens' rights issues or the ones who are focusing on development um, work. And um, so that's something to think about. And, uh, Ahmed, and how, uh, what, uh, I mean, how are you balancing this notion between cert the need to actually continue uh, the large scale political changes and, and changing at the top so that you can build these, these different kinds of institutions and in which <coughs> takes your people into the street with the need to actually serve uh, the people's interest in having basic needs met. I mean, how do you, how do you balance those competing demands on revolutionary actors? So, um in our organization, for example, that 
we need to keep a struggle. So we need to, uh, when we see something bad, we demonstrate or make a pressure against that. Uh, and sometimes they arrest somebody of our members and put him in the jail with any charges in any demonstration. Uh, so it sometimes uh, stop or make obstacles to any social efforts or uh, building uh, bases in the street. Uh, to make all the movement sometimes, focusing about how to make uh, these guys inside the jail free and how to make a pressure to make them free. And this strategy used by the regime, they, every week you can find, if you follow the news in Egypt, you, every, every, every day you can find someone in the jail from the, the movements, every sex and another movements. So it's, it's make us uh, sometimes having time to make any efforts in the, in the street, social efforts or building bases or spread awareness or something like that. But now in our group and with other groups try to make uh, a group, small groups to think, or like th small think tanks, and the small groups in the foundation. And we help with uh, the social NGOs like Jawad and other, uh, other groups to, to complete our efforts. Uh, uh, pressure groups and NGOs and political parties uh, to work together to build alternative. And now there is many efforts now uh, to build the alternative. Muslim Brotherhood have a machine, have a money, have a number, have a, a strategy, have uh, NGOs. Uh, so they, they won many elections because they have a machine and have experience from more than 80 years. And now we want to build alternative uh, between cooperating with pressure groups and political parties and NGOs to complete our efforts. No. Okay, and what, what are the chances that you'll be able to uh, build an effective um, coalition of opposition movements to, to, have, uh, you know, to make a difference in the electoral realm? Um, the problem is that, that we are in, in, in the beginning, maybe in Kijiwan, in, in, <laughs> in, in, in democracy. Not in Kijiwan, but we are in the beginning after the revolution. It was more than... 30 years in dictatorship, no, it's uh, 60 years, no political parties, uh, no one can talk uh, his opinion free, no one uh, can establish a political party or make a meeting without state security. Uh, so now it's open. So we need to learn how to organize ourselves. So we need to learn how to make organization, organization like movements, real movements, a real political party, so it will take a time. And what's the role of, of the U.S. Uh, as, a, as a donor country, as, a, as an important uh, influential di diplomatic force in the region in enabling this, this, what you're laying out as a very long-term trajectory towards real change? So in Egypt, you know, we want to, we want to us away from, from the revolution. <laughs> But if we agree or not agree, U.S. have a rule. Um, before the revolution, U.S. supported Mubarak. Uh, they was uh, afraid from Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists, so they, they supported Mubarak. And they give him a green light to do anything. Uh, after the revolution, U.S. supported the SCAF. U.S. supported military council. Uh, and they give him a green light to do anything. Uh, now, U.S. supporting Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> they use the same strategy. Uh, in Egypt, we don't want tear gas. U.S. supporting Muslim Brotherhood with tear gas. So we don't, uh, we don't need tear gas. So uh, the problem that if U.S. want to support something, support democracy, supporting NGOs. For example, the American NGOs in after the revolution, it's working very hard to make a training to the new organization in Egypt. But after the NGOs trials with the military, it's a deal between the military and US governments put American NGOs away from Egypt and it will be a peace relation between Egypt and US. 
Now there is no American NGOs in Egypt. Now the Egyptian in this case uh, in a trial and also Americans also like Rupert uh, in the same trial in Egypt. So it's um, relation is benefits now between government and government and don't care about principles. Right, so Jawad? Yeah, so, so one thing about elections, because you want to be realistic, is that so we, we were setting a budget for like every seat in the parliament. So I mean a minimum of uh, half a million Egyptian pounds, which is probably like now $90,000. So and w when I was talking to other parties, uh, you know, and how much budget do they have? So they have like a million, 500,000 for every seat. So there's also, I mean, very clear uh, uh, logistical issues and financial issues that even if we have people wanting us and all that stuff, we don't have the financial means to, to do that. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people have been apathetic and just watching and just criticizing. They're living their lives on Facebook and they know just uh, Twitter and saying all this stuff. And when it comes to, to the real issue and okay, so pay, you know, in, <laughs> in supporting a candidate instead of, I'm mean, talking about my family and all my friends and all this, I'm not just talking about like other people. And no, they're not really, uh, I know we were So you're suggesting that the, that the U.S. should give more? I'm not, this is before the, the, the question before the U.S. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would get killed if you just put this sentence. <laughs> no, so I'm talking about Egyptians, uh, even Egyptians abroad, that they can actually pay and they're allowed legally to pay for, uh, for uh, elections to, uh, to fund. This is, there's legally, th there's no problem. So that's the first question. So financial issue is a big issue. And we can have much more seats if we have financial means. The second issue about the US, US intervention, I, I, uh, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. There's so much to say, but yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to be politically correct. But I, I, I think you know, uh, the US uh, w will interfere whether we like it or not. Uh, and uh, maybe, uh, as I said, you know, there are very obvious. Uh, I mean, the, a lot of the government officials come here and they talk with them. And I think uh, things have become much more clear on what are the, m the major problems. So I think if we continue in the future and raising issues about uh, uh, freedom and, and actually, as Ahmed said, you know, supporting NGOs, uh, giving trainings and so on and so forth, that would be education. education. There's a lot of things that have no, there's no you know, uh, uh, disagreement much about. I mean, you have very good universities here. You have very good uh, education programs. So. Can I so just add yeah, please. On, on that? Yeah, on the financial issue, there's a difference between Egypt and Tunisia, whereas in Egypt, obviously, it's seen as toxic to be accepting US money. But in Tunisia, it's seen that everybody is doing that from the government right down to the smallest three-person NGO. But beyond um, financial um, aid, I think there's a lot that the US can do. And this is from my interviews with people where the suggestions were that they're interested in more partnerships and sort of horizontal interactions. So for example, the Social Democrats in Tunisia have a trainer from the Labour Party come in, uh, Labour Party in England come in to um, help them with messaging, branding and organization. And similarly, um, in Egypt, I've sort of well talked to Ahmed about Otpo and then also how one can study or interact with movements here, whether it's something like Move On or even the Tea Party, actually, to learn about how you can be a pressure group or a, or a lobby group. Um, so, and also more sort of people-to-people -people exchanges, whether it's between jurists or um, uh, between those in the legislature or, or students. And, and what about political messaging? Should, should the US be sending different messages to the, to the president of Egypt, to President Morsi? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and what would those messages be? I don't know what is exactly this message, but um, I, I think the messages that must come from U.S. to with the president and the government in Egypt is that it's a, a process of democracy, and U.S. will not stop supporting in dictatorship because they supported Mubarak, the SCAF. And now I think the message, message that it will be very harm to U.S. if U.S. supports uh, a new dictatorship. So the message must coming from U.S. that we will not support anything against real democracy. And, and uh, if the U.S. intervenes in that way and starts commenting on the situation in, in Egypt, 
does that work in the, the Brotherhood's favor, um, given the perceptions of U.S. meddling historically? Uh, okay. to add? Uh, I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, some, some of these messages actually was, uh, you know, if, uh, would give, a, you know, uh, an evidence that the Muslim Brotherhood is actually not with the, with the U.S. government and, you know, that, that would give them uh, populist support on the ground. So I think the messaging, is the messaging I mean, uh, I know like uh, Senator Kerry went uh, and, uh, and spoke about the Turkey issue. Uh, you know, he actually caused, he could have sent that message behind the scenes and, and, and you, if, you, if the U.S. wants to really send a message, you don't have to do it. I mean, we all understand there's different ways to, to messaging and, and if you really want to put a point across, you, you will put it across without actually, you know, doing it in a public way. Privately, yeah, I think that's a good point. There's one question I want to ask before we open it up to the audience, and, and that is this uh, issue of whether or not youth are being pushed too much into the NGO sector. Um, because we've talked about the, the problem of corruption in, in state institutions, the fact that the older generation is, is dominating through promotion of ideology through their presence, long-term presence um, in, in institutions. I mean, should, should the youth actually be more engaged and should we be supporting youth presence in state institutions more rather than constantly pushing them into the NGO sector? Am I correct in, in thinking this is, this is a problem? Um, and, and how do we actually address it in, in the NGO sector yes because youth are very active your group is very active in the streets in in you know creating think tanks and promoting new ideas a Jawad is working at the local level in a very commendable way um, nor you've talked to different youth groups but I mean are we are youth too inclined to to resort to uh, NGO activism rather than engaging in institutions? Are, is, is U.S. assistance money or foreign or aid uh, going too much into the NGO sector and not enough in supporting the development of, of youth uh, presence in, in, in institutions? Do you I think NGOs' is, is, uh, role is very important in, in Egypt because uh, NGO can make a training to political parties. NGOs can make a training to movements like upper sex. NGOs can make a development in the street. NGOs can uh, spread awareness. And because our, our, our struggle and our war, not, not with the, the regime only, no, it's with the, the old principles, and the old regime, the old uh, ideas. So it's uh, long term war. So NGOs will help in, in that to help us and help political parties and help other NGOs to uh, to spread awareness and helping people to how to vote and uh, don't um, take a money and uh, vote for someone. No, think before voting. But then how do you penetrate those ideas into the institutions, Jawad? Yeah. I think that's an amazing question because uh, so in the beginning, for example, s several of us, uh, w for example, I was nominated youth minister and I declined. And, and one of the major issues is that w we are in a process. The last thing we want is to do the same mistake people in government now are doing, is that learning by doing. So you're practicing on the people, right? So one of the ways is NGOs is a process, it's a stage to actually understanding the real problems and finding real solutions. So I think uh, I agree that on, on, on the short, long term that we will eventually be put in, in government. And we're taking it step by sp bit. So, so for example, I'm now the youngest guy, I mean, by 30 years on the, uh, on the water and the sewage council. It's a council that oversees like billions of investments in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the infrastructure of Egypt. And you're learning, you're, you're discovering new things. And, and so, so I think it's a matter of, I agree, it's a matter of time that we have to be in the government, but we have to be ready and prepared. And one of the programs that Ahmed is with me and other uh, uh, active revolutionaries is the Leadership for Change. This is a program we did for six months in which we brought uh, government officials, previous government officials, we brought different experts, and we had people explain how the government and how 
things actually work in Egypt and what are some of the solutions or concrete solutions that, are, uh, that can be done. So when we are ready and when we are, we are, it's not a matter of getting positions, but also having the content and uh, uh, the thing that so we can do real change. I mean, what's the purpose of getting a position and you can't do the change that people will hate you after that. And that's an ethical responsibility that I feel that we have to do it before we take any position. Noor, what's your perspective? Do, do the youth have enough trust in the institutions of state at this point to, to want to engage, one, and two, is foreign assistance being directed too much into the NGO sector? Um, How to balance out the, these I think that yeah, youth interests. have chosen the NGO sector over politics, but I did interview youth from across the political spectrum in the Salafi uh, party, the Brotherhood, as well as the secular parties. And there's a lot going on within them because they all also talk about this generation gap within the parties, irrespective of their political stripes, where actually the old sort of sclerotic way of functioning within the parties means that there's no kind of internal democracy or accountability or even consensus-based decision-making. And that's something that youth that I saw in Tunisia were really active in trying to change. Um, and there is, I think it's not about the US pushing for things, but maybe youth pushing for them, pushing themselves. For example, within, I think there are four areas of political activity that youth can, which I've seen happening in Tunisia and, and Yemen, and sometimes in Egypt too, where youth can engage with um, that building a presence when it comes to m mediation, advocacy, institutions, and community. So what do I mean by that? With institutions, for example, um, youth in Tunisia have um, quotas in all of the political parties where they're actually part of the decision-making structure. So they're part of the central political committees or have their own parallel structures, which isn't really the case in Egypt. Um, and in Yemen, they've got a quota on the national dialogue as well. When it comes to um, advocacy, we have, I mean, uh, April 6th, there's a great pressure group, obviously, but in Tunisia, there's ICBIS, which is the pressure group um, within the Nahada party uh, formed by youth to, to, it literally means to tighten the screw or to put pressure. Um, and to be able to link single issues, so whether you're focusing on labor rights or, or political rights to link that to a broader political platform. And then I was talking about community because a lot of, there's a lot of community-based action that existed during the time of the revolution. For example, the local coordination committees in Egypt. And I feel that youth could probably make better use of those and it'd be interesting to see if any of that translates into political capital when it comes to the elections. And then finally, mediation. This is something that actually has happened once in Egypt, where I think youth could make better use of, their, of the moral authority they had from the revolution to try and mediate um, between the opposition and the government in, because the climate is so polarized right now. And this did happen a couple of months ago where actually uh, youth um, it's at the insistence of the youth that a meeting was finally arranged between the opposition and the president. Um, so to be able to use that kind of convening and mediating power a bit more. So yeah, <laughs> I have a comment uh, that I, uh, I was inside. Uh, I was a member in constitutional, constitutional assembly and I was like the president from president advisors, but not officially. Uh, they asked me to be official, but I said, no, I want to be from the National Front to advise the president. Until now, I, can't, I couldn't do anything. They said we are the majority, and that's it. And they ignored everything. And the people and the opposition blamed me because I'm, I was in, inside the regime sometimes. So it's uh, to be involved inside the regime and uh, the rules of corruption, the rules of all the regime is still working, so it's, uh, it will be not useful. We need to change the regime first, then be involved after that. Or change mm -hmm. the people's thinking. Yes. And the <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we're going to open it for questions. I'm going to alternate uh, sides. We'll start here uh, at the front. There's a woman here, yes. Uh, can you wait for the mic and state your name and affiliation? 
my name is Jasani Michelle. I'm with the Public International Law and Policy Group. Uh, my question is pretty much for everybody. Beyond the United States, what is the most valuable role that you believe the international community can play in facilitating positive development in Egypt? I think that we've kind of touched on this, so I'm going to take uh, another question um, here f for us and then have the speakers answer a few of them. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Leila. Yeah. Um, I think it was Jawad or Ahmad, I'm not too sure, who spoke about the declining popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood. That's something that's not in doubt. I mean, it's palpable if you read the Arab press. Everybody knows that their popularity is in decline. My question is about what's happening on the opposition side. There's also that sense that the opposition is in political disarray, that they haven't gotten their act together, and that even if they were to participate in the upcoming elections, they won't be able to translate uh, the, into victories the popular anger that, is, uh, that the Muslim Brotherhood um, is, is facing. Uh, so that, that's my first question. My very quick second question, if I may, um, is about the issue of foreign support and foreign funding. I understand that um, many of the youth movements and the opposition want to hold on to their ideals that prompted them to take to the street in the first place, but there's also a, a degree of realpolitik that is required. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has very strong uh, foreign supporters, including very well-to-do Arab governments in the Gulf. Uh, how do you suggest that the opposition find these resources if they're unwilling to reach out and do what the Muslim Brotherhood is doing in accepting foreign assistance? Thanks. Okay, that links up well with the previous question. So, um, sure. go ahead, <laughs> Ahmed. Do you want to start? Okay, uh, opposition uh, popularity. Uh, yes, um, in, in November 2012, when the uh, present decree about the, the general prosecutor uh, and the new constitution, it was big demonstrations have. 300,000 or more in Cairo and El Tahadiyya Palace and many governorates. And it was the uh, popularity of Muslim Brotherhood down and the opposition is up. It was opportunity to the opposition to work on that and, and celebration front. But they didn't use that. They didn't organize and they refused to participate in the elections and many issues that make now the popularity of the opposition is down and Muslim Brotherhood now is up sometimes because they used uh, social services to increase popularity. Yes, it's, it's a big mistake with the opposition. And if the opposition want to doing well and to get the majority and uh, mobilizing people, they want, they need to change the strategy of just de demonstrating without real connecting with the people and without uh, organization. Uh, it's our mistake and we try to, to solve it. Uh, about the funding. Before we talk about the funding, Joad, do you okay. want to comment a bit about um, the opposition's popularity? Yeah, I just don't want to put all the opposition in one, one, one bracket. That's not fair. So, I mean, I, mean, I, I would differentiate between Hamzawi, Dr. Zihab Ba'iddin, and uh, between Sabahi and Baradei. And these are two different generations. And I'm telling you, there are huge issues going within the opposition. And these are all leaders in the opposition front. So I, I, I think one of the things that you might be seeing change now is that the opposition is try to starting now to, you know, it's like any group that comes up in the beginning, they come together, then they discover the differences. So I think the opposition now will be divided into people who actually, you know, uh, know how to utilize and, and, and actually, you know, look uh, forward to actually utilizing this uh, uh, this momentum and, and to doing uh, something on the next. And they will, I, I think the opposition will go into parliament, or they will run for parliament because you know, the other option is actually uh, disastrous. Uh, so I, I, I don't disagree, I, I agree that. So. And are they reaching the people? I think there are a group uh, that are. And are uh, they d d countering the, the I, I think, I mean, and yes, I think there is a group that is actually, you know, working on the ground and, this, and, and they're fundraising and, and they are actually you know, talking to different families who are strong in different uh, small towns. And I, I mean, this is happening actually, you know, right now. Of course, not as you know, <laughs> as close to the different uh, machines uh, of the other groups. You know, do you want to comment on the Egyptian opposition and their strategies? Well, I mean, from uh, I've got the feeling that the opposition's politics is really a kind of politics of of no. And even though young people are very unhappy 
with how the Brotherhood hasn't delivered on any of its promises in relation to unemployment or social or economic justice, that the opposition hasn't really been able to use that because it doesn't have any particular political platform. And then also there's the issue of um, grassroots work and especially when it comes to um, there's a presence in Cairo and the Delta area but there's very little um, party activity in Upper Egypt so the questions that that raises uh, again for the opposition and it's changing I mean, I mean if you look now you see like well going to different uh, well Ghanim and Mustafa Nagar and um, you find now they're realizing they're going to all uh, you everyone now is all the young people are actually going around like all the Egypt and trying to, to, to reach out to the grassroots. And the older generation cannot, this is the issue, they, they don't have the, the energy, they don't have the space to actually do that. So that's uh, not all the older generation, I'm just, I'm not, you know, of course there are amazing people who are older, but so I'm not. Reaching out by knocking on doors <laughs> or reaching out through social media? No, knocking on doors and mm -hmm. having, actually going to universities uh, uh, and having talks. And, and this is what actually is going to uh, uh, be of essence in the future. Okay, and just quickly on the issue of how to counter uh, money that's c coming in from different external sources, from the Gulf, from ex others, uh, to support the, the Muslim Brotherhood, the dominant majority party. How, how do we, can we counter that? That see, money see, and I, how? I, I, we had this discussion <laughs> before, and, and unfortunately, maybe, f I don't know, we have very strict values on, uh, I'm talking to about myself, about who's funding me, and, and I'm sticking to them, I mean, until now, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm very cautious who pays, I've not taken any foreign funding, uh, so, uh, you know, we just have to, uh, I'm trying to hold to my values and not, you know, get someone buys me off. Yeah. So you're crowdsourcing, you're getting I'm money from the people? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so it's most of our funding is crowdsourcing. The same with us, where as a sex movement, you know, uh, when we talk with someone from any American NGO, uh, NDI or IRI or uh, Freedom House, when we talk before the revolution, the old regime, Mubarak regime, and now Muslim Brotherhood use this issue that see a per sex movement take money from abroad to destroy Egypt. They travel to Serbia <laughs> and this rumor. So if we talk any foreign funding, they will use that. So we, we, uh, we depending on our membership fee, we can choose uh, foreign funding. That's a problem. Interesting. We have a question here in the front. Yes, please. Can you wait for the mic, please? My name is Ibrahim Hussein. I'm an Egyptian American living here in Washington, D.C. I have been following Egypt, of course, since the revolution. And it really breaks my heart how divided Egypt is and how the, the, the division is spiraling downward and getting the attention away from the real problem like economy, education, transportation, health. Uh, and the question is, how could we, you talked about alternative, how would the alternative be if the opposition start asking to join the government of, Muslim, of the Muslim Brotherhood? You have been asked to be a minister of, of youth. Why can't some of the leaders, like uh, Amr Musa, become the foreign minister? Why don't we look at unity, or government unity, which is really critical to bend the two sides together and instead of trying to analyze how bad each side is, let alone the opposition is so divided. Thank you. I, th I think one of the demands of the opposition to participate in the elections is that neutral, uh, neutral people be appointed to cabinet yeah. positions. Yeah. What's the likelihood of that happening? No, it's not going to happen. And uh, I, I mean, I'm on the ground. Did you ask for it? Yeah, ask for what? Yeah, of They've course. Yeah, yeah. They, they asked for it, and 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 I I'm on the ground, and I can tell you stories of how uh, and the government <laughs> now positions. Okay, so now where I I'm staying, they appointed uh, the local mayor uh, a Muslim Brotherhood. That was uh, three months ago. I mean, uh, that that happened in my neighborhood, right? And different, and 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 there are. Uh, 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 my point is, you know, we we. We just want the best for Egypt, and we are really, we have no personal interest or no, actually, it's not a matter of we're fighting the Muslim Brotherhood just for the sake of Muslim We're just calling for 
the Muslim Brotherhood, they are certain in government now, is that to try to involve everyone equally, right? So, and, and this has not have been happening. This, that hasn't been happening right now. And uh, for you're asking about joining the government. I mean, it's, we are not hungry for positions. I, I will accept a position when I know there's a, there's a group that I'm going to work for that's going to listen to me. It's not just a, 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 a political statement that someone is going to uh, use on and say, you know, oh, look here, Jawad is very nice. We have him, uh, and I'm just sitting as a puppy. And uh, it's like when Ahmed went to, to the legis and the and the, and the what do you call it? the stool, the constitution, uh, same, same yeah. thing. So the fact is, we uh, are are willing and want to build our country when we are sure, right, that we are being listened to and we are being uh, 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 have real influence. If I'm telling you, if the, if the young Muslim Brotherhood themselves have issues with the older ones and they're not being listened, they're going to come and listen to me. So you don't want to lose credibility before yes. you can have I, an I impact. I have experience yeah. that also. Um, uh, from two months, it was a, a violent wave in Egypt. Every week you can find clashes and someone killed. So uh, me and, and friends like uh, Mustafa Nagar and Wal Ghanim began to using Al-Azhar to make agreement for non-violence. And to build on that, to uh, make principles, to negotiate and find solution to compromise. Uh, so when we, after other agreements, uh, we said with Muslim Brotherhood and opposition to find solution. We need the solution to stop violence in Egypt, to stop frustration leading from vi for violence. Uh, so Muslim Brotherhood, what is the, uh, the point of opposition? Uh, constitution and uh, alliance governments, participating, participating governments, and uh, the general prosecutor. And Muslim Brotherhood refused to negotiate about anything of that. They said, if you want to change the constitution or the government or prosecutor running in the election first, and we will see if you take the majority. Mm -hmm. And the rules of election is controlled by Muslim Brotherhood. That is the, the problem. Okay. Uh, we have a question over here. Thank you. Fari Borz uh, Fatemi, Ox Oxford Charter Group. Um, thank you for your presentation. But what I don't seem to hear is you have a population that's 60% uh, under the age of 30 and probably 90% unemployed. Are there any programs or any advocacy for programs or discussions going on of what to do about the unemployment uh, with the government or opposition uh, to take to the people to say, these are our programs to get the country moving forward? Thank you. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, and this dialogue is something that we don't disagree upon with the government. And we, 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 you know, we had something called Egypt uh, uh, Vision 2020, which we invited different groups on f putting the vision for Egypt and working on economic policies. There's an economic policy that actually has been worked on for the past two years, has been presented to the government. That was just a month ago. Uh, but to be honest, I mean, this is so hard to achieve when there isn't political stability. You know, uh, I mean, all this is very nice, and but the issue now, people and investors and, and economic reform goes along with political stability and uh, people saying where Egypt is going. So when you, now you don't even know when is the parliamentary elections is going to happen. So you don't know what are the laws and regulations are, are, are going to be in place, what are, who are the political powers. We, the government is not stable. So, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is realizing this more and more, that they cannot do it on their own. And there has to be political stability, there has to be economic stability, and if there's not economic stability, the people will not be happy, and they will not continue in power. Because the economy is the number one thing that is going to keep people uh, 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 voting for the, the majority or the government. Ahmed, do you want to add anything on this issue of politics versus economics? Which comes first? No, I'm, 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 I'm agree with what uh, Gawad said that uh, projects or programs, we have ideas, other, uh, other young movements uh, or, or uh, NGOs, we have many programs and many projects, but uh, we have many obstacles that there is no funding to these projects, there is no supporting from the government or any international institutions. Uh, and sometimes uh, the, uh, the political issues uh, prevent any, any issue, any efforts to development. That's a problem. Um, can I just yeah, add please. something? I should say that 
youth are more focused on political issues than the economic ones, but I also just wanted to maybe put that within the context of two other revolutions and actually Hannah um, Arendt's writing on uh, the American and the French Revolution and her sort of preference for the American Revolution because of its um, initial focus on building legitimate uh, and enduring institutions that focused on freedoms as opposed to the French institution, which she felt kind of got too embroiled in what she called the social question and a focus on socioeconomic issues, which kind of then muddied the water, waters when it came to political rights. So I just wanted to bring in some sort of uh, sense of what happens in transitions. I think this is a big issue everywhere after all revolutions. You know, do you focus on the political or the social issue? And it's always a struggle. Uh, and yeah. I know, not to be like general, I will give you specifics. So for example, uh, we had a program for uh, project for entrepreneurship centers, right? So entrepreneurship centers to be established around the country. And actually we got funding for it. And we got funding, it's been a year and a half. And the government will not release my money. So I mean, they're not just only li and, yeah, not listening. They are, they are not actually cooperating and making it so hard for me to, like, I don't want anything from them. I didn't ask them for funding. I didn't ask them, for, I'm just asking, you know, just let me work. And that's been hard. So, I mean, there is, a, there is, a, there is an issue with the system itself. You know. is, it, is it bureaucratic in, inertia and breakdown, or is it actual political uh, challenge? So, so, so there are three things, actually. There are, there are bureaucratic, pure bureaucratic, yani deep state that is involved in Egypt. Number two, there are, uh, you know, you don't have the proper political hat, you know, uh, and I, I have this discussion all the time. So the medical center, you want it uh, open, yeah, uh, yeah, change, uh, yeah, put some sign here and there, you know, uh, make it easy for you. So that's the new thing that I, uh, you know, I, that's, uh, that's tough to do. Sometimes corruption. Corruption is the third thing. And uh, there is no willing to do that. And also now if any good projects or uh, services, uh, it's leaded or controlled by Muslim Brotherhood Party, the FJ party. Uh, th the new system of uh, um, social funding, social aid, the law of the Saudi, the Arabic or the Raish, social support. Social projects, yeah. Yes, it's controlled by Muslim Brotherhood only, not another party. So it's a corruption, bureaucracy, and also. The Muslim Brotherhood wants any good issues for them only. So they're serving their own constituencies? Yes. Okay. Uh, we do you have questions in the back? Thank you. Uh, my name is Tofik Mavudi. I'm a PhD candidate at American University. So uh, my question is uh, that before the Constitution referendum, the opposition first they campaigned to boycott the referendum, but then a few days before the referendum, <laughs> they actually com campaigned that they will vote no. And by this, they were sending mixed message to the mass. And so the question is, what the opposition, what, what, what have you as the opposition done to build consensus within the opposition? As, as, as Gawad says, uh, uh, the opposition is not one category, and there are different groups within the opposition. So what have you done to build consensus to, to increase cohesion within the opposition to, to be able to increase your own votes? And at the same time, as, as the results of the referendum shows, Cairo voted no for the constitution. And, and it shows that actually Cairo is not all Egypt. And the opposition mainly focus was on Egypt. So what have you done? What Okay. Do you have what any have you plans? done to build consensus? Thank yes, you. and do you have any plans to work on the local levels and, and other governors? Thank you. So, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's why I told you the opposition is going to elections, because uh, <laughs> they say no, no, and then they go in at the end. So the idea is, uh, uh, as I told you, we're doing the youth list for parliament, inshallah. That's what we're working on, getting the youth. That's our criteria now. Uh, and not only in Cairo, and going around like in, in different governance. So this is the actual. This is what you know. This is uh, to answer your question. Uh, that's what we're doing actually. I mean, very concretely, you know, getting a youth list under 40 to run for elections. People are qualified and uh, getting proper funding for it. And uh, that's it. 
Is there consensus within the, the opposition? Uh, opposition is and if not, where is it? Is, do they differ on strategy versus substance? Opposition now is not uh, one stream or not stream. It's, uh, it's from uh, the old political parties like the Loved Party, like uh, another old political parties, and also the new political parties like the Stur Party or Tahrir uh, Shabi with uh, Badai or, or, or Sabahi. That is the Revision Front. And also the, the, the persons and uh, leader persons in NDB before the revolution now, they are in opposition. That is the problem. Because maybe confined political parties can accept working with NDB or the, uh, the persons from former regime and the revolutionary movements didn't accept that. So that is so sometimes make a problem inside. Opposition is revolution and old parties and some, some persons from old regime. So it's, it's not homogeneous uh, sometimes. And that's the reason lead for boycotting or vote for no. Uh, and there is no time. It was this decision, boycotting then vote for no, within 10 days. So there is no effective in, in the street. No one by cuts and no one vote for no. Consensus building on the opposition? No, I just agree with Ahmed, exactly, yeah. So nothing more to say. Nor do you want to add anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think there's been much consensus <laughs> building. <laughs> is there more consensus in Tunisia? Um, in the opposition? Uh, well, there is now because there's a new party, Nida Tunis, which um, has caused a lot of controversy because it actually includes members of the old regime. And the consensus lies around the fact that they're all anti Nahida, which goes back to my old point about uh, you know, that being their one political platform is, is the anti-Islamist one. But <coughs> beyond that, um, not really. But I have to say there's a difference in the generations between um, the youth of, of these parties who are more focused on doing grassroots work and building some sort of base that way. Okay, uh, we have a question here. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian Greenberg with Interaction. Um, there's, there seems to be a kind of predicament uh, raised by political ideology and critical political discourse in Egypt, which seems to put you at a disadvantage in moving forward. And that, if you will, is based on a kind of double standard where external uh, interests, external financial resources are seen to be anathema for Egypt if, for example, they're seen to come from the United States. So that the, uh, if you will, the traditional reflex of, of understanding that events in Egypt are largely shaped by outside forces like the United States is a problem. Can so you ask, that for is there a question? I'll, I'll very quickly get to my Please question. Do. So that, for example, you, are on, you have to be very careful about the sources of funding that you accept to support your work. On the other hand, and here's the double standard, and my question for you is how do you address this double standard? In a nationalist, effectively a nationalist revolution, how is it that the Muslim Brotherhood and its Salafi supporters in the Gulf are essentially not criticized in the same way for the external intervention? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, do you understand the, the question? Well, a very complicated question, yeah. Yanni. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 and my uh, education level is not that high. <laughs> but uh, it's a very hard question to answer. I, the question I, is really, you know, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafis are gaining uh, mo taking money, money from can. outside. So why can't you take uh, yeah. money from, from the U.S. or for other yeah. organizations? S so that's what I'm saying. They, they, they are, but they have, I mean, it's, they, they are a little bit, you know what I mean? Actually, they are. They are getting critiqued for it. But, they, uh, you know, it's, it's a war uh, getting on both sides. And I, I, I don't see, a, I don't see a, a, an answer, actually, to how to do it or how to solve it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, from, on my, um, from my front, it's, it's, it's hard to just say, 
yeah, I'm going to take money from outside, from whoever, and, uh, and just use that. Uh, that's too much of a risk, to be honest. Is there mounting critique against uh, Islamists who are taking money from the Gulf? Yeah. We, we, and the media, yes, they have, to, about, especially Qatar, you know, coming in. Because, I mean, I mean, also, you know what, to be honest, some of the foreign funding, I'm sorry, to, are, are very stupid in funding, you know. They'll be like, they want to put their logo, you know, and uh, say we have done so and so. I mean, other parties are being funded, like, you know, there's investments coming in. You know, nobody's going to have a problem with investments and doing projects and stuff like that. So uh, sometimes I, I, I doubt the sincerity of the people who actually want to fund. You know, they just want to do a, a political uh, uh, point against you. So you're saying the Gulf money is coming in in a quiet way, whereas the U.S., for instance, will want to brand their assistance? Of course. Ahmed? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's imagine if we accept the, the foreign funding, if we accept that and uh, can, uh, can accept the criticism from, from uh, uh, the Islamist and the security. But uh, I think U.S. don't want to invest in, in NGOs or in don't want to invest in, in Egypt anymore. Uh, I feel that uh, there is um, no real uh, work and for, for my perspective that I, I can't feel that there is no uh, real work in Egypt to, to support democracy or to support freedom. Uh, maybe before the revolution it was better than now. Oh, okay, over here, uh, the gentleman in the blue tie. Yes, I'm Thomas Gorgisian with uh, At Tahrir, Egyptian daily newspaper. How do you see, Ahmed and Jawad, the role of the media, social media and the traditional media in promoting, and I will put a slash, hindering the change in Egypt? Because I can see now that uh, whether opposition or rulers, Juan and brothers, are doing the same thing in, is as if it's the media is the replacement of political discourse. There is no parliament, but there is no there is social media, there are tweets. There are all this kind of going on, which is as if it's, this is the change and not the real parliament and real change in the world. Okay, let's take one more question before we have the panelists answer. Uh, we have one here. My name is Amin Mahmoud, I'm with the American Egyptian Strategic Alliance. And my question to Ahmed in particular, uh, that's as a youth organization and play a great role in a revolution, how you can still follow a failure opposition, uh, m uh, in particular the old leadership who had the role and the gun, they had very honorable role, but, but the role is gone. Uh, and uh, as Jawad mentioned, some of the young people, Mustafa Nagar, uh, Hamzawi and others, really making a uh, difference. They go on the street, they go to different uh, uh, different uh, district, and uh, they rally the people. You should really announce you're going to the election because that's the only way to democracy. We build the institution. You should announce it from now and work with the opposition to select the district and put people together. Yes, but you should announce from today you are going to the election and you have people running. Can you turn that because into a question? Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm asking Ahmed if you will agree to do that. Okay. So is tweeting enough and are you going to go to elections? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the first question about uh, social media. Uh, uh, before the revolution, we were the kings of social media. Before the revolution. <laughs> uh, we are the first group maybe in the world used Facebook and Twitter in mobilizing people from 2008 and 2007, and maybe before that also. Uh, now, any political party, anyone, the, the military using social media against us, the security using social media against us, Muslim Brotherhood have army to using social media against anyone. So now social media is the weapon anyone can use against anyone. Uh, so it's, it's a war on social media. But if we look about, about the, what happened in, in referendum, in 2011, if you join Twitter or Facebook and see what happened, 
you will uh, expect that all Egyptians will vote for no because all Egyptians on Twitter and Facebook said vote for no. But what happened that 70% vote for yes because the work in social media and in the internet is different to work in the street because uh, the majority of Egyptians haven't computer, uh, haven't TV sometimes in, in the poor in the poverty neighborhoods. So uh, we need to, okay, now we can work in social media, but we need to improve our ability to work in the street in uh, Upper Egypt, in Sinai, in the poverty neighborhoods, like uh, the uh, Jawad efforts in, in the poverty areas. We need to improve that and to build the real uh, grassroots. About all the old readers uh, and young readers, yes, I, I, I accept to to work with uh, young leaders like Hamzawi, like uh, uh, many, many persons to mobilizing people and uh, to go through the, the, the in Upper Egypt and the uh, far uh, uh, governorates to working with them and I support the idea of participating and against the old same ideas that made us in this position. I support this idea. Okay. Jawad, you want to? Yeah, just the first one. I, I think, uh, you know, you can't just keep blaming the Muslim Brotherhood and keep bashing them. And I, I don't think that's, uh, that's fair enough. That's the easy way out. But I think the, the other position, there is no real uh, concrete solution or clear, a clear alternative that actually people can look up to and, and hold on to and actually support. So I think, you know, both sides have not been successful, to be honest. And, um, you know, um, I think now there's the chance for uh, a, a third uh, group that actually can come in and have concrete solutions, concrete things that people can actually hold on to and, 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 and support. And the social media will do an effect. We have 30 million Internet users. So, you know, one of the things that if you plan for now for the presidential elections and work from now, on creating a platform and, you know, and using that and, and utilizing the use uh, you, you can do a difference, but this is limited to what do you actually offer. You have to work on what a real solution that people can actually hold on to. Nora, do you want to comment a little bit on this perspective of social media and yeah. how it was an agent of change and now it's well, proliferated to the point of yeah, I'd being diffuse? It, it was a tool for organizing in the early days or, or pre-revolution, but afterwards it's become more of a war zone. I mean, every single political party has a thousand, I mean, there are thousands of Facebook pages and there's one young journalist said to me in Tunisia that this, I mean, the polarization that you see in society has been taken to the Facebook pages and that she often has to sort of look outdoors just to see there isn't a civil war going on just because <laughs> there's so many battles taking place on Facebook, basically about identity politics. And, but I think that there is this realization, actually both Ahmed and Nawad and Jawad were talking about it, that you, uh, I mean, that one can't just organize on social media and that one has to go out and do grassroots work. And I have been seeing that shift. So maybe it's no longer the same tool for mobilization, but it's certainly an important tool for debate. Um, yes, so, I mean, it's, it's a forum for It's a debate. forum for debate and yeah. that's, and it's, increasing access to social media could be important in getting ideas out and and encouraging more participation in public debate but it's not the it's not the end of the the game um, so we'll take just one more question uh, before closing here yes I'm Deborah Alexander, and I've just concluded my career at the Department of State. And my question really is asking you to step back a little bit. You know, political reform, change, revolution, certainly Egypt isn't the only country in the last 20 years that has undergone this. And I'm wondering if uh, other youth and civil society organizations, how they supported you, or have you learned from them? Have you established any working relationships with organizations in other countries that have undergone a similar kind of change? Thank you. Thank you. Joad, you're working in other countries, so 
Yeah. So, so <laughs> actually, we, we we are establishing, uh, for example, a branch to our. One of the reasons I'm here is we're establishing a branch for our NGO in in the states. So, uh, and actually, I am meeting different organizations uh, from around the world and to learn from their experience, uh, whether on the political level or on the NGO civil society level and how they structure and how they uh, manage the governance within the organizations and all that stuff and the bylaws and and so I and and this is uh, this is a great opportunity for me to be here is that meeting different people and different organizations and we are doing that and and we have I mean luckily we have the proper uh, the platform or the brand that actually gives us makes people interested to be part of or s to join in with us and I think I agree it's very important and we we're doing that <laughs> um, uh, as a press movement, we before the revolution we cooperated with uh, outward movement in in, in Serbia, uh, and we learned more uh, from uh, the strategy that happened in, in in Serbia before the revolution, and also uh, solidarity movement in Poland. Also, uh, it's uh, uh, how to use strikes uh, to build uh, a movement. Uh, that was our 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 starting in April uh, strike. So we 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 follow many information about what happened in Eastern Europe, especially Poland and and, and Serbia, and uh, what happened after the revolution. Now we uh, studied also what happened after the revolution with uh, Slovakia, for example, when the uh, nationalists take the authority, and then after nine years uh, the liberal take the authority by election. So it's a, it's very important experience in in Slovakia. Um, that about experience and, and information uh, about what happened. Uh, about real connection now, uh, we have a connection with, for example, for uh, Occupy Movement in the US. Uh, we have a good relation with UNCAT in the uh, UK, in uh, the opposition movement in Spain and uh, Greece and Italy, and uh, in Sudan, in Morocco, in Syria, before the civil war. Uh, so we try to, we got information uh, from the, the, the movements make revolution before, and we try to give information to uh, new groups in, 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 uh, in many countries. Uh, and we have uh, press sex branches in, in Europe and in US also try to, uh, to uh, not mobilizing, but to Organize the people here and in, in Europe and outside Egypt too for voting, for election, for referendum. So it's very important that the the, the, the young groups in, in all the countries help each other to supporting uh, real democracy. Okay, given Egypt's very messy transition, um, can you tell us what you think the the mistake was in your strategy from from January 2011 when you went to the streets to today? Our was there one one strategic mistake that we can look at? Yes, our strategic mistake that we trust the military after the revolution and we meet them two days before, uh, after Mubarak. It was a big mistake that we said we will leave Tahrir Square and now we need to take a rest and we will negotiate with the military. It was a big mistake uh, because they, um, they bluffed they make uh, tricks and they lying too much uh, and they put us in this track from the beginning uh, this is uh, the first mistake the second mistake from my perspective that we as a youth movement not every sex only that we didn't we said we are not the owner of the revolution and it's uh, the people revolution so we didn't reform a leadership uh, for this revolution and that is made the, the scaf cooperated with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood against us. Uh, the third mistake, I don't know if that's a mistake or not, now all the people blaming us because we supported Morsi. Uh, I don't know if it's a mistake or not, but we, we didn't find any solution, any, any choice. So we supported Morsi, and that is the result now. Okay. So what? I, I, I <laughs> I agree. I, I, uh, I, my, my main issue is that we did not organize together as a group and, and, and get united and have a proper representation. That's number one. Number two, we actually, you know, we, we had the chance to have, for example, a TV channel, you know, and a media outlet to speak for ourselves. And we didn't. And uh, we should have taken that uh, position because what happened is that people 
you know, we have people representing the revolution and the media choosing who represents the revolution and they would bring the wrong people and speak in a way that will make people hate us, right? And, and someone will be shouting and swearing and so on and so forth. So we used to have a positive, uh, you know, image of these young, educated, uh, you know, people who are loving the country to people who are, you know, uh, uh, misbehaved, who, you know, just swear and shout and so on and so on. I think, I mean, adding to Ahmed, this, these are the, the two things that I think uh, are very important. Yeah. Noor, do you have any thoughts on it? Um, just actually mirroring what they say, that I think that there's been a fragmentation in terms of both um, objectives, I mean, focusing on single issues, and also with a lack of um, uh, leadership and, and structure. Yeah, without wanting to end on a negative note, I, I have to commend uh, Ahmed Jawad um, for, for your efforts. And one thing that really strikes me is the maturity with which you're speaking about the current situation in Egypt. Um, and you're, you're very much looking long term. And I, I think that that's, that's a positive. Um, and you're, you're working at multiple levels, at the grassroots level. Um, and at, at the, the higher political level. So, um, so I think that, that we should commend you for, for your efforts and uh, learning from the mistakes. We hope that uh, lessons will be learned and, and progress will be made. Um, Noor, thank you very much for joining us. And I, I think you gave us good uh, food for thought <coughs> reflecting on a broader context. So um, thank thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.